Well, good evening, everyone. A word of greeting to those here in Wesley Hall, as well as those who are watching online. We're thankful for your presence as well. Let me just quickly say, tonight is the last Bible study of the spring. Uh, we are having next Wednesday evening, we hope you'll come and be a part of that, just what we call a night of worship. So at six, there's no meal next week, but at six o'clock next week, we'll have a worship service in here. Uh, Kathleen McMurray will be preaching. I hope you'll come and be a part of that. It's always the way in which we end the spring study time. And then we'll take a break. Uh, summer is so erratic in so many different ways. We'll pick up, we'll have a, a back in the swing in the fall and move forward from there. So I appreciate very much all of you who've been a part of the study this fall and spring. So tonight, because it's a one-time thing, a couple of weeks ago, I know Jay Clark was here last week and I appreciate him filling in. I was I had a terrible week. I was on the beach in Seaside, Florida. It was so hard. I mean, I struggled, but uh, I mean, I struggled to come back is what I meant. But anyway, it, it was nice. It was a nice little break, kind of a last minute opportunity for us, and we took advantage of it. So anyway, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we dealt with the story of Adam and Eve. For those of you who remember, last week, Jay Clark was here. So tonight, we have a one-time study. It is the book of Jonah. Now, everybody knows where the book of Jonah is. I don't need to tell you, but I'm going to anyway. It's right after Obadiah and right before Micah. So isn't that easy? So go ahead and find in your table of contents uh, the book of Jonah. It's uh, a short book. We're going to look at it tonight. Uh, so please, seriously. When I was in seminary, I used to be so embarrassed when I first started. When we'd talk about a book in the Bible, I wasn't exactly sure where it was. And then I looked around the room, and everybody else has the table of contents open, and they're looking, trying to find it in the index or wherever. So just uh, go ahead and find it, whatever page it is. And in, your, in my Bible, it's on page 1003, so if that's helpful. But anyway, I'll give you a moment to find it. Yeah. No, I don't have small print, I can assure you. Hey. <laughs> After Obadiah. Come on now, everybody knows where Obadiah is, right before Micah. So I'll give you just another moment, and then we're going to get right into it. Everybody find it? Anybody need help? Obadiah. Yeah, if, you, if, if you have it on your phone, it ought to be pretty easy, I would hope. So I have to tell you all a quick story. When we first had iPhones, uh, I had a Bible study one night, and uh, or whatever we were studying, I said, if you open up your Bibles, and all of a sudden, people started pulling out their phones. And after the study, I told Susan, I said, I am so offended. I started with my Bible study, and all these people got their phones out. And she went, hey, doofus, they got their phones out because you can get your Bible on the phone. I went, really? You can do that? How cool is that? So that's been a number of years ago, obviously. All right, so we're in the book of Jonah. Y'all ready? Here we go. Chapter 1, verse 1, the book of Jonah. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. Now, I want you to notice something right off the bat. Jonah is filled with themes. I want you to notice right off the bat, we know that Jonah is the son of Amittai. It's right, it gets to the action immediately. There's no kind of long introductory or even short introductory kind of statement about any of this. Immediately, we know Jonah's given a task right in the very beginning. Go and preach. That's what God tells Jonah to do to the people of Nineveh because there is, is wickedness. Now, I want you to see, it says, its wickedness has come up before me. It is the understanding that God is above and God is watching over Nineveh because up is going to represent God and we're going to see in just a moment that down represents trying to get away from God or darkness or the depths, okay? So we know right off the bat, Jonah, the son of Amittai, is given a task. Go and preach to the wicked people of Nineveh. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa. I want you to see the theme. God is up. How do you get away from God? Ideally, you go down, right? The other direction. Of course, we recognize and we're going to see that you cannot get away from God. But Jonah and the writer of Jonah make this 
point clear. Jonah wants nothing to do with the task that God has given him. And the task is go and preach to the wicked people of Nineveh. And what Jonah does is not respond to God. Hey, I'm not interested. I don't want this responsibility. You remember Moses does that when God says, I want you to go back from whence you came and free my people. And what does Moses say? I'm not interested and I've got a speech impediment. I don't want the gig. Here, there is nothing verbally communicated by Jonah back to God. He just simply tries to go in the other direction. And if God is up, what is the other direction? Down. So what we see is that he tries to get away from the Lord. He went down to Joppa. He's not done going down. Where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Now notice this, we understand in three verses, Jonah's given a task, it says he tries to run away from the Lord and he tries to flee from the Lord. The writer of the book of Jonah wants you to be clear in your understanding that he's doing everything in his power to not only get away from God, but get away from the responsibility that God has placed upon him to go and preach. Y'all with me so far? Okay. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid, and each cried to his own God, so the ship is filled with sailors who are pagans. They cried out to his own God, and they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone, notice this, below deck another layer of going down into the depths. Do you see that? That's intentional. Where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. So Jonah's intent to, is to continually try to get away from God. God is up. Jonah is down as far as he can go. He goes down into the bottom of the ship and then he lays down. He's as far down as he can go with the intent of trying to escape from God. The captain went to him and said, how can you sleep? Now notice this, get up and call on your God. So a pagan captain comes to Jonah and says, get up. In other words, take responsibility. How can you sleep through all this? And call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us so that we will not perish. So notice this, that you have a pagan captain who recognizes that there must be something about Jonah's God, for Jonah has tried to escape. Then the sailors said to each other, come let us cast lots to find out who is responsible for this calamity. They cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. So they decide, if you will, they're going to flip a coin. And whoever uh, d uh, calls tails and it comes up heads, that's the one. So in this case, they draw straws, if you will, and it falls on Jonah. He gets the short end of the stick, which means they assume then he is the guilty party. He has caused the storm and the threat of these sailors losing their lives. They cast lots that fell on Jonah, so they ask him, tell us, who is responsible for making all this trouble for us? What kind of work do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? So they blitz him with questions. Now they just make the assumption that he must be the one because he has drawn the short straw. He must be the reason for this. And ironically, their assumption is correct. He answered, I am a Hebrew a Jew, and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. So notice what Jonah does. God gives him a task. He immediately tries to flee from God. And then Jonah proudly declares who he is. I'm a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made all of this. That's who I am. This, ter this terrified them, and they ask, what have you done? They knew he was running away from the Lord because he had already told them so. 
So now you have these pagans who were worked up into a frenzy because a Hebrew who worships the God of all creation has tried to flee from God. But God is not going to let that happen, so God creates a storm. The pagans in the process recognize that that is a God of great power, and we're going to see in just a moment what happens to these pagans. The sea was getting rougher and rougher, so they asked him, what should we do to make the, to make the sea calm down for us? How do we calm the storm? Now, notice the response. Is there sarcasm in this? Was he very intentional about expressing this? Was he fed up and put out what was going on with Jonah? Because look what he says. Pick me up and throw me into the sea. Now, what rational person would say that? into a sea where there is a storm. And it will become calm. I know that it is my fault that this great storm has come upon you. So is he filled with regret and remorse? Well, at this point, it's a good question to ask. But for whatever reason, he acknowledges that, yeah, you're right. I drew the short straw, and all of this is happening because I have fled from God. So get rid of me. And the storm will cease. Instead, the men did their best to row back to land. Now, look at how they're, if you will, trying to stand up for Jonah, trying to spare him of his own request. What is his request? Throw me overboard. Everything will be calm. Well, that seems so irrational, certainly, obviously, irresponsible. So Jonah has a group of men around him who do their best to just row back to the land, sparing him. But they could not, for the sea grew even wilder than before. Then they cried out to the Lord. Now look at this. What has Jonah inadvertently done? Not even intending to do so, what has he done? He has converted a ship of pagans. Notice this. They cried out to the Lord, Please, Lord, do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man. For you, Lord, have done as you pleased. So now you have, interestingly enough, a group of sailors who were pagans on a ship who, because of the trauma that they are experiencing in the moment, take on faith of a Hebrew who has caused all this to happen to begin with. They took Jonah and threw him overboard. The raging sea grew calm. At this, the men greatly feared the Lord. That means they have ultimate reverence and respect for God. And they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. Do you see how extraordinary this is? Do you see what's happened here? we're going to see that Jonah has done something unimaginable. There is something about this man, because we're not done with Jonah, somehow converting people and not necessarily even wanting or intending to do so. In all of this, a bunch of pagans have become followers of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And not only that, they make a commitment to God. That is a vow, a vow of faithfulness, and they make some kind of sacrifice, uh, an expression, an indication of their commitment to God. So Jonah, interestingly enough, remember, go to the wicked people and preach to them so they'll be converted. I don't want it. He doesn't say it, but he shows it. In the process, he takes a group of people and converts them without even intending to do so. Y'all with me so far? Y'all with me so far? Okay, all right, make sure you're out there. Now the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Jesus would later on talk about the sign of Jonah, making reference to the amount of time that Jonah was in the belly of the fish. Three days. Got it? What else happened during a three-day Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Y'all know, y'all know about that, right? Good, please tell me you know about that. Okay. So, 
The Lord provided a huge fish, swallowed Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of fish for three days and three nights. From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord. No kidding. His God. Now, I don't know what it's like to be inside a fish. Has anybody ever been swallowed by a fish? Tell me, because I want to hear your description. I'll give you the microphone. I can't imagine what that would be like. Jonah's in the belly of a fish. Notice where is a fish? Down. The point of all that is Jonah is now as low as you can go. And who put Jonah in the belly of a fish? God. So who's the one who's in control of this all along? Though it appears as though Jonah is a rebel and unwilling to respond, who ultimately is controlling this whole situation? God. Jonah cannot flee from God. That's one of the things that the writer of Jonah wants you to be very clear about in the story of Jonah. It's impossible to flee from God. And when God has given you a task, you can flee, run, do whatever you want, but eventually you're going to have to deal with it. Back in the old days, now they just do videos at annual conference when clergy retire because clergy, get, they used to let them get up and talk and say something about their career and they would go on and on and ramble. It would take way too long and bishops would have to politely ask them to go sit down and that kind of thing. But I remember one guy got up and he said, I got to tell you, he was, had some other career before we went in the ministry and he said, you know, I fought uh, God for years. I tried to flee from God continually. But then it dawned on me a call to ministry is like vomiting. You can put it off for a while, but eventually you got to get up and do something about it. And I thought, well, that is about the most crude but accurate description I can imagine. You're going to have to deal with it somehow, right? So what Jonah has tried to do is flee from God. Now he's at his lowest place. And when he is as low as you can go, what does he choose to do? Remember, he proudly said, I'm a Hebrew. I worship the God of all creation. You're in the belly of the fish. You might want to consider a prayer. So this is what Jonah prays. In my distress, I called to the Lord and he answered me from deep in the realm of the dead. I called for help and you listened to my cry. You hurled me into the depths. Yep. He's been hurled into the depths into the very heart of the seas, and the current swirled around me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. I said, I have been banished from your sight, yet I will look again toward your holy temple. The engulfing waters threatened me. The deep surrounded me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. To the roots of the mountains, I sank down. Down means despair. It means emptiness, darkness. The earth beneath barred me in forever. But you, Lord, my God, brought my life, what is the next word? Up. You see that? From the pit. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer did what? Rose to you. Do you see up and rose? Do you see what's happening? Everything's down, 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 down. And now, God, you are the God who will bring me out of all this. I'm lifted up. I rise up. It is the notion that when we surrender to God, God is the one who embraces us and lifts us up out of the situation in which we presently find ourselves. In this particular situation, Jonah finds himself in the belly of a fish. And my prayer rose up to you, to your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. But I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will make good. I will say salvation comes from the Lord. And the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. So Jonah has been hurled out of the fish. I don't know what it's like to have a fish that large vomit all over you, but surely you went and got a shower or something, right? Uh, he's gross. He's nasty. But he's been spewed out. He's been given another chance. Notice what he says. I will say salvation comes from the Lord. And as soon as he says that, what happens? He's spit out. Another opportunity, another chance. God already told him to do something. He did everything in his power to get away from God as quickly as he could. And that could have easily been the end of him because he kept going down and down and down. But God would rise him up 
and God would give him another chance. So then in chapter 3, then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. So remember, God says go and preach. This time God says go and proclaim. It's the same thing. Now notice what Jonah does. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now we're going to see that Jonah will do this rather reluctantly. When Jonah's been given a second chance, just like many of us, it doesn't always mean that everything changes dramatically and all of a sudden our attitude is much better about things, right? I mean, for many of us, we've been in the depths of despair and shame and guilt and regret and all those kind of things, and we pray to God, if I get out of this and God gives us another chance, and sometimes in the process of doing so, we don't follow through. We're not nearly as... Um, enthusiastic about that as we might have been when we were in the midst of despair. But go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city proclaiming, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed, and all of them, with the greatest, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. That means they repented. They asked for forgiveness. Notice there's something about Jonah. A bunch of pagan sailors are converted because of Jonah. Jonah goes into Nineveh, and immediately when he goes in there, everybody, we're going to see even the animals, repent. Everybody repents. No wonder God would choose somebody like Jonah. What is the quality that he possesses that enables him to do that? I don't know, but he's a very convincing figure. He goes into the middle of the city, and he tells them, and they believe, and they fast. And the greatest to the least put on sackcloth. They repent. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, notice what he does. He rose from his throne. That means he's following God. You see the difference? Jonah fled from God. Where is God? God is up for the, for the Hebrew people. God is up. So what does the king do? He rises. That means he responds accordingly. He rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. That was the visible expression of remorse, of repentance. So even the king in Nineveh does that. And this is the proclamation he issued in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink. But let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. That means let people and animals all repent. Everybody and everything. We're not going to miss, says the king, any opportunity. We don't want little, any little situation to cause us to be destroyed by God. Everybody and everything must repent. Let everyone call urgent, urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. Now notice what God does we're going to see in the book of Jonah. What does it mean to relent? It means to change one's mind, right? Right? There are numerous times in the Bible where God says, particularly in the Old Testament, I'm about to wipe you all out. And then the scripture says, God relents. At the end of 2 Samuel, David, who is king of Israel and Judah, they've been reunited by his power. Israel and Judah fought in the civil war, if you will, for a long time. David had his adversaries, but eventually, by the end of 2 Samuel, David is king over Israel and Judah. 
And David decides that he is going to have a census taken. He's going to count the people. And God says, uh-uh, you don't count my people. I count my people. And David does it anyway. And it angers God. And God said, I'm going to give you a choice. Three things you can choose from. Seven years of famine. It's like a month of something and three days of pestilence of people being infected and he chooses the three days and for three days it ends up 70,000 people die and then God says I'm about to unload on you again I'm not done you've upset me greatly and David says God give me another chance and the scripture says God changed his mind about what he would do to David and the Israelite people. You remember in the book of Genesis, Abraham says, I'm about to unleash my fury on Sodom and Gomorrah. I'm wiping everybody out. And what does Abraham say? Hey, listen, God, if you find a hundred righteous people in Sodom and Gomorrah, will you spare them? And God says, all right, I changed my mind. If I find a hundred righteous, I'll spare them. And Abraham says, listen, you're the God of all creation. I don't have a right to ask this, but God, what if you find 50 righteous? And God says, okay, if I find 50 righteous, I change my mind. I won't destroy them all. I'll spare the 50. And Abraham narrows that number down to like 10. And every time God changes God's mind. So there are numerous times in scripture where God says, I'm going to do something. And then God says, nope, I'm not going to do it after all. So here at this point, the king of Nineveh hopes that if we do all that we know we should do to show our regret and our shame to God and show that we are a people who are repenting, surely God will change God's mind. Are you all with me? Now, in the book of um, Peter says in the New Testament, um, in 2 Peter, Peter says, God will have, essentially, I'm paraphrasing, but essentially, God will have infinite patience with us so that all will be saved. In other words, it's almost like God gets angry. I've done, and we've all done, I've had it. I'm about to unleash my fury. And then we take a moment to think about it. Never mind, I'm not going to do that after all. So here the idea is to hope and pray. We've put on sackcloth and ashes. Surely, God, surely, if we do everything, you ask us to do, you'll change your mind about destroying the city of Nineveh. All right. Chapter four, but to Jonah, this seemed very wrong and he became angry. Now, notice this. He prayed to the Lord. Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? This is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew God, I knew it. That you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, I want you to see this. Jonah does what God asks him to do only after what? He's been in the belly of a fish for three days, right? And he goes into Nineveh and he does exactly what God would have him to do. And in the process, the people respond accordingly to the very word that Jonah gave them. Repent, turn from your evil ways and follow God. And they all do that. And what is Jonah's response? Makes me mad, dead gummit. These people are going to be spared. God, I knew you were a God of compassion. That's why I didn't want any part of this to begin with. I knew you were a God of love. And I knew you'd change your mind about what you said you were going to do if they actually did what you, they, you said they should do. Jonah's angry about the fact that God is going to spare those people. Have you ever... How do I say this? Have you ever been in a situation where, uh, you don't have to raise your hand on this one, but you, you're so angry with somebody or so upset about a situation that you, the last thing you want is that person to experience grace? Uh, well, I mean, we, we, we all know that, right? I mean, and we also know really, really horrible situations where you, you hear about somebody who's been just as awful to other human beings as they can be, I, I've heard this 
a number of times where people have conversion experiences in prison. I mean, they've done the most wretched of things to other human beings. And they have a conversion experience that they believe to be uh, uh, genuine and sincere. And I think to myself, now, Dad, gummit, I don't want that. I don't want that for them. I want them to live forever and ever being punished for what they did. Have you ever had that kind of feeling? I mean, you have, whether you're not your head or not. I get it. I mean, there are times when we just don't want people to experience the very thing we desperately want, and that is grace and forgiveness and the mercy of God, right? I always want it. I'm going to go ahead and tell you up front. I always, always want it, even if I don't always want it for everybody else, though I should point of all this is that Jonah is upset. He didn't want the gig to begin with. He only responds accordingly after he's in the belly of a fish. He does everything God asked him to do, and the people respond accordingly, and Jonah is angered by that. He knew that this God of compassion would do the compassionate thing. Now, the Lord, now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. Now, he has a junior high boy response to all this, right? Ned Gummin, if I don't get my way, I don't care. I, I'll just die. I'd rather just die than put up with this. I can't bear the thought of the people of Nineveh being spared. Uh, rather melodramatic, is it not? But that's his response. This is Jonah's response to all this. He is that reluctant one who does what God would have him to do only after he tried to flee from God and couldn't get away with it. All right. But the Lord replied, is it right for you to be angry? Jonah had gone out and sat down at a place east of the city. There he made for himself a shelter, sat in the shade, waited to see what would happen to the city. So here you have Jonah now who separates himself enough that he can overlook the city and he's just waiting to see. Are they going to be wiped out? Is God going to spare them? What's going to happen? I'm sure he's got his popcorn. He's sitting back in a recliner. He's got a pina colada. He is waiting to see all the action take place, right? Then the Lord God provided a leafy plant and made it grow over Jonah to give him shade for his head to ease his discomforts. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. So while Jonah's sitting there, there's a tree that springs up. It's hot outside. There's a lot of sun. You know, he doesn't have any sunscreen. He's got to be sure and be in the shade. And he's in the shade with his pina colada and his popcorn. And he's watching, waiting to see all that's going to happen. Life is good. Life is good. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm, which chewed the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind, and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, it would be better for me to die than to live. He says it again. Come on, dude. What is your deal, right? I mean, Jonah doesn't get his way, and when Jonah doesn't get his way, he's ready to end it all. This melodramatic kind of approach to life, for whatever reason, God chooses to take that away from Jonah. And when God takes it away, it's an indication of God's power. God controls the situation. God can spring a tree up and God can get rid of that tree. Jonah, I'm God, you're not. You don't decide what happens to the people of Nineveh. So I'm gonna show you that I can bring up a tree, cover you, make you comfortable, and I can get rid of that tree in the blink of an eye. You can't do it, I'm God, I get to decide what happens. You don't. And Jonah's response, once again, is an immature kind of response. I don't want anything to do with these people. Just let me die. But God said to Jonah, is it right that you be angry about the plant? It is, he said, and I am so angry, I wish I were dead. Three times Jonah makes that statement. This makes me so mad. I just want to die. Now look at how this ends. It is an extraordinary ending to this story. But the Lord said, you've been concerned about this plant. Now notice what's a fury infuriating to God. What is Jonah more concerned about? The plant than he is the people of Nineveh. He is more concerned about his own comfort, his own well-being, than he is about an entire city of people whose very souls are at stake and whose very lives are 
could potentially be lost. Do you see that? Have you ever noticed in life how sometimes we actually take what is important and we relegate it to a status of inferiority and that which is really inferior, we elevate to a status of supremacy? We do that with people, right? I mean, that's just the way it is sometimes. We get lost in all this and you know, I remember during COVID, we all remember COVID. What a lovely time in human history that was. And trying to be in the church, we would have people who would say to me, I'd get emails from people, calls from people all the time. If you make people wear masks, I'm never coming back, ever, okay? I'd get calls, emails from people. If everybody in there is not completely masked, I'm never coming back, okay? In all of that, I wanted to say to both sides, where is compassionate and understanding for all of this? I have my rights, this is what I'm gonna say. Let's think about the bigger picture in all this. The bigger picture is right now, we don't let anybody in. We're just trying to do the best we can with all this. And masks became the focal point for a lot of stuff. Um, and sometimes we do that with different things. And so in this particular instance, God is saying to Jonah, you're more concerned about this dead gum plant and you're so worked up, you're willing to die over that and you're not concerned at all about an entire city of people. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. And should I not have, now notice this, this is God's question to Jonah. And should I have not concern for the great city of Nineveh in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left? And also many animals. It's it. That's it. Jonah's over. There's no response from Jonah. There's nothing else from God. God asked Jonah, you're more worked up over a plant. I'm more worked up. Shouldn't I be over 120,000 people? That's where it ends. Some scholars have thought, well, that's, you know, that's not the original ending. Others have said it's clearly the original ending. That's the intent behind this, to leave people hanging. One of the things that Jesus did masterfully well in telling parables is that oftentimes, very rarely, I should say, Jesus refused to give an explanation about the parable. There were a couple of times where he does it. The sowing of the seed, some seed falls on rocky ground and others, and then he tells us what the seed represents and what the rocky ground represents and the weeds and all that kind of stuff. But more often than not, God tells a parable and just leaves, uh, Jesus tells a parable, just leaves it out there. You walk away with it. And what happens is it's a great teaching tool. People are thinking about it, not just then, but they continue to think about it. What did he mean by that? What was he talking about here? It stays with us. And most scholars believe that that's how Jonah ends, with the idea that this story is to stay with us and we're to think about where we are in the story. Now, there are always going to be people who say, is the story of Jonah literally true? Was he really in the belly of a fish? How could that be? How could he breathe? How could he go to the bathroom for three days? All the other stuff. That's not the point of the story at all. Sometimes in Scripture, or all the time in Scripture, there is truth in what we read. And we have to determine for ourselves what truth means. If you believe literally that there was a Jonah who was literally swallowed by a fish, spewed out through God's grace, helped spare the people of Nineveh, that is great and wonderful. If you believe that Jonah is like a lengthy parable that's leaving a message for all of us to deal with, just as Jesus told parables, then that's all well and good. One way or another, it's about truth. And the truth is that we can find ourselves oftentimes like Jonah, where we know we've been given a task by God and we try in our own way, whatever that looks like, to flee from it, not to take on the responsibility, only to find ourselves in a situation one day where we're given another opportunity to do what God would have us to do, and then we should respond accordingly or we choose not to. In one way or another, we have to deal with those circumstances. Jonah is a fascinating story. I've done a series of sermons on Jonah a long time ago when I was young. I threw them all away because it was not a good sermon series for me. But one of these days, maybe, or wasn't for anybody else for that matter, particularly the listener. But uh, maybe one of these days I'll try another series 
on Jonah, but, and we'll look at uh, some of the great themes in that. We don't have time to really talk about all the themes tonight because we're short on time, but it's a story that you should go back and read again and again and, and look at the, the themes of going down, God is here, Jonah is here. The king of Nineveh is down here, but immediately he rises up. The people of Nineveh are down here, but immediately they rise up. Who's the one it takes a long time the very one God calls, the very one who's got the skill set to tell these people is the very one who's the most reluctant in all of this to be who God would have him to be and do what God would have him to do. Jonah is the most reluctant one in the whole story. And then when he follows through, he's angry because he did what God would have him to do, knowing God would do what God does and give people another chance. It's a fascinating story. I hope you'll read it again and again. I want to say a word of appreciation and thanks again for being a part of Bible study. I do hope you'll come next Thursday evening. I think it's going to be a nice service of worship, a good opportunity for us just to gather, hear great music, hear great preaching, and be with one another. We'll take time off. We'll meet again in the fall. Several people have asked me, what are we going to study in the fall? And my answer is, I don't have any idea yet. But uh, when we get to it, we'll get to it. We'll start with chapter 1, verse 1. We'll read every verse till we get to the end. We'll have a good meal as we do on Wednesday evening, and I hope you'll be a part of that. Let's pray. God, we are thankful for this fall and spring, for the opportunity we had to study the gospel of Luke, to realize once again your grace and your love and your compassion for the most wretched of people, the downtrodden folk just like us. So we pray your blessing on us as we have studied your word. We pray that you continue to give us the courage to be who you call us to be. And may we find within ourselves the capacity to continue to study your word, even though we may not formally gather together for a number of weeks, may we make scripture reading very much a part of who we are. This is how you speak to us. This is who we are, a people of the word. May we truly live that way. So for the gift of your Holy Spirit, for the meal that was enjoyed tonight, for all that you provide for us, particularly your love, mercy, forgiveness, and grace, we give you the greatest of thanks. In the name of the risen Christ, we pray. Amen. I will see you Sunday morning, I hope.